morning, Grace Chapel. Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us. It's good to see all of your faces. Welcome to you who are joining us online. I love our new setup. This was something I dreamed about where we'd be a little bit more in concentric circles and have some table seating over there. How are the tables for you guys? All right? Good. You can have coffee, take notes. Yeah, well, hopefully you will come back and join us. If you've not yet been in our worship center or it's been a while, please come and join us this Christmas season. I'm excited about what God's doing here. I'm excited today to continue our series entitled, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And we're going to talk about what it means for us to be content. Now, I'm going to guess that most males in this room have not yet started their Christmas shopping. Most males, we, we like to wait until the very last moment. And in fact, if we're honest, there are some of us who may still owe our wife a gift from last Christmas because what we got her seemingly wasn't exactly what she wanted. But I would love it if you would help me understand something. I, I just don't understand why a woman wouldn't want an emergency kit for her car that has a jump jumping cable box in it. It has everything she needs for her tires. And if she gets caught in this, I just don't know why that gift, you know, if a random guy bought that for his wife, I don't know why that would not just please her over the top. And no doubt we have this season where we receive things and maybe sometimes expectations are missed and we have to learn to be content with what we have been given. I want today to talk about contentment. I want to hit the idea of what it means for us to be fully content with whatever gift we are given or whatever hand we've been dealt in this life. I've entitled my message today, How to Maintain Contentment. I say maintain because I want for the average Christian to have a level of contentment. Now, I would hope that you would go beyond maintaining to cultivating, growing, exceeding amounts of contentment in your life. That would be my hope for you. But I want us to move to a place of, com from complaining to a place of contentment. And I'm going to guess that every single one of us in this room has something we would say we are not content with. It might be a circumstance that we wish was different about our life. It might be a relationship that isn't exactly right. Things aren't going well there and we, we wish things would change. We wish we had closer friends. We wish that loved one wouldn't treat us that way. We wish that person wasn't going through some of the struggles that they're going through. I wish we could turn the clock back and our relationships would be like Christmases of old and the memories would be as sweet as they used to be. Perhaps some of us aren't content with the possessions we have. There are certain things in our life we want more of. There are certain things we're not happy that we have enough of. And so we struggle with contentment. My, my thought as we approach the text today is that all of us probably struggle with contentment at some level in our life, whether we admit it or not. My hope is that today, through the power of the Spirit and the truth of God's Word, I will stir in your heart a desire to get rid of a lack of contentment or discontentment in your life and I will propel you forward, push you into Christ all the more so that you can see he is worth all contentment in this life, even when circumstances, relationships, or possessions fail us. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open up with me to the book of Ruth. We're going to look at Ruth, and it's found on page 222 in the Bibles in front of you. I'm going to unpack an Old Testament book, uh, really the whole entire thing. We're going to do a survey of the whole thing. I'm going to unpack this book for you in our time here together, at least high level, showing you what discontentment looks like, and then giving you at least three biblical keys to maintaining or cultivating contentment in your life. So hold on. Get your Bibles ready because we are going to be flipping through this story and I'm going to be pointing out specific passages. And I want you to see these passages with your own two eyes. Now you can follow along in the Grace Chapel app if you'd like. My notes are also in there for you. But I want your eyes on a Bible ready to follow along with me through these passages. As I said, we will define discontentment. And of course, while we're at it, might as well define contentment. But then I will give you three keys to cultivating or maintaining contentment in your life. With that as our goal, will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Christ. 
We thank you that no matter what we've been given in this life, if we have faith in your son, we have everything that we need. Even when the world around us fails us, even when the people we love the most disappoint us, we know, God, that your son is perfect, that he is perpetually perfect and always the same perfection for all of eternity. So will you help us rely upon him all the more? Will you help us love him all the more through this Old Testament story? May you please, Father, nudge us more into the heart of your son and in greater reliance upon the gospel as we look at this Old Testament passage. We love you. In the name of Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. In this series, we're looking at stories that come from Bethlehem. We spent some time last week in Genesis, and now we are just a little bit further in the Old Testament in Ruth. And this book, or at least part of this book, is set in Bethlehem. The people most certainly are from Bethlehem. Now let me just give you some main characters because we're going to be doing a survey of this book. There's a couple characters you need to know their names right off the bat. First is, you guessed it, Ruth. Ruth is a key character and she has the name book name of the book named after her. So Ruth is in this story. She is the daughter-in-law. So think about the family structure here for a moment. She's the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi was married to a man who was from Bethlehem. If you look at the text here in verse 5, well, actually, all the way in verse 1, you can see that, that in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. So we're starting with Naomi's husband, a man from Bethlehem. He left Bethlehem, and he went to Moab with his wife, and his sons, and his sons ended up marrying two women who were there in Moab. This would have been quite a journey for them. They would have had to go around the Dead Sea. If you can picture it on a map, you have Israel, which is kind of this little coastal city uh, to the west of the Dead Sea, and they would have had to go from the plains or even the hills down through the plains, down through the valley of the Jordan River, all the way across to the other side of the Dead Sea to this place called Moab. Moab would have been nothing like the the city of Bethlehem. It would have been nothing like the Hebrew uh, groups of people that would have been settled in Israel. They would have been people who worshipped many different gods. They wouldn't have worshipped just the one true God. They would have worshipped many different gods. And in some ways, it probably wasn't right for these Hebrew men, according to their understanding of what Yahweh, God, wanted. It probably wasn't right for them to marry women from this other nation. Not at that time. That's not what the Lord had for them. But they did, and God used it. These are people that were outside of God's chosen people. Ruth and her fellow sister-in-law were outside of God's chosen people, married to these Hebrew men, and now settling for some 10 years in Moab. You can see there in verse 4. They took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there for about 10 years. They left their homeland of Israel because of a famine. They find themselves in Moab, not only with good food, but pretty wives. So they settle down there for 10 years. While they're there, tragedy strikes. Naomi's a main character. Ruth is a main character. Orpah's with us for a moment, but then she ends up leaving the story. And we're going to meet another man named Boaz, but he's back in Bethlehem. Let's think about while they're here in Moab, what happens? What's the tragedy that strikes them? Well, uh, Naomi's husband dies. And not only that, her two sons die. Imagine the grief that must have stricken her life as she loses the man who has been providing for her, who led her out of the land in order to better provide for the family. And she loses her two sons, which is any hope of a lineage, yet alone any hope of someone else taking care of her. She gets to this place of being totally distraught. She tells her her daughter-in-law to basically flee an old yeller moment in the Old Testament. Go, get away from me. Don't don't stay with me. Orpah basically is like, okay, fine, I loved you, but I am going to move on. I'm going to find a new husband. 
Ruth clung to her. It says that she wept. She continued to cling to her and weep, wouldn't let go of Naomi and said, I'm following you back to Bethlehem. Naomi had heard news that God was showing his faithfulness in Bethlehem. You can see that in verse 6 and 7. The famine was over, so she wants to head back. And Ruth insists all the way through verse 14 that she's going to go with her mother-in-law and stay with her and return back to the land, really, of her late husband. She fought with her. The mother-in-law said to the daughter-in-law, no, you can't go with me. No, you need to stay here. No, come on, don't go. Finally, she stopped the fight. And look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, Naomi returned and Ruth, the Moabite. So Naomi is returning to her land among the Hebrew people, but she has a daughter-in-law from her son who has now passed away, who is a Moabite, and they return together to the, from the country of Moab. And it came, they came to the city of Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So this story starts with people from Bethlehem. It has a slight journey in Moab, and then it returns back to Bethlehem by the end of chapter 1. All of this is not coincidence. The Lord is certainly doing something here that is profound. And the fact that it's happening in Bethlehem isn't just left up to chance. The very place where Jesus Christ would be born, the very place where a Savior would come into the world, that's the place where this story is happening. I don't think it's coincidence that it's happening at the beginning of the barley harvest, that it's happening at the beginning of harvest season. Because we knew that the bread of life, Jesus Christ himself, who said, I am the bread of life, eat of me and you will have life. That very same Messiah that would come some hundreds of years later is now kind of being foretold through the story of Ruth. You might say, well, explain more, Josh. I'm not quite fully on your train yet. Okay, let me point out a couple things to you. The Lord is preparing a way for the lineage of Christ in the very town that Jesus Christ would be born. Remember that I said that, and I'll come back to it in a moment. Naomi shows back up in Bethlehem. She's bitter, no doubt. How would you not be bitter? You lost your husband. You lost your son. There's bitterness all over her. In fact, in verse 20 of chapter 1, you can see it there for yourself, she even tells them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means embittered or embittered towards God. She's mad at the circumstances she's been dealt. In context of our message today, she's discontent, but like to the nth degree. She hates that she's lost her husband. She hates that she's lost her sons. She has a daughter-in-law who's seemingly a Klingon in her grief. And she's back to this place hoping to just be able to be with her people, eat, but maybe just lie down and die in the land that she once loved. She tells them, you must call me bitter because that's how she felt. I'm, I'm bitter. I'm, I'm distraught. I'm not okay with my circumstances I think I can identify with that. Perhaps you've been there as well. You've gotten to the place where you feel a bit of bitterness that comes into your heart because things aren't going the way that you thought. Maybe it's not all your life, but there are circumstances in your life where you feel a little bit mad at God. Why did this happen this way? We get to this place where our discontentment metastasizes and becomes some kind of cancer for our soul. We walk around discouraged. We walk around complaining. We walk around with great sadness or downcastness of heart, as the psalmist said, where we're sad and, oh, downcast is our soul. We seemingly have no hope. I have a way of turning anthills into mountains. I can be in some kind of emotional turmoil in my life. I can have something go off the rails in a relationship, and all of a sudden, man, I feel like it is all-consuming. In fact, if I was honest with you, I had one of those moments yesterday where I found myself for about an hour or two, I'd like to say it was shorter, I sat in my chair rocking my youngest son, Patton, a little frustrated, a little embittered, 
a little bit mad about something in my life that seemingly wasn't going the way that I thought it should go. So God and I had a firm talking with. I told him what I felt. But by the end of that, I sat there like a, like a puddle of mush because the Lord had to do some things to convict my soul that maybe my complaining wasn't right. Maybe my values were a little bit off. Maybe it wasn't right for me to be embittered towards God, and I'll take out the maybe. For sure, it's not right to be embittered towards God. But it's okay for us at times to express where we are disappointed or discontent and to say to the Lord, Lord, I need you to change my heart. My friends, discontentment is dangerous. If you find yourself constantly discontent, you are in a dangerous place. Discontentment has a way of stealing our joy and ruining our witness. Discontentment comes in and it snatches any joy that the Lord's already given us, where we can be so consumed about what we don't have or what's not going our way that it steals that joy and it also ruins our witness, for we are called to be the light of the world, to show the world that we have hope no matter what our circumstances are. So when we walk around mad, discontent, Doubting the goodness of God. What we're really doing is we're, we're spreading a bad witness. That's not what Christians are to do. It doesn't mean we can't have sad moments. It doesn't mean we can't say, oh, downcast, oh, my soul. But the next phrase is, put your hope in God. For you have everything you need in him. And our witness should show on our face and in our actions and the way we conduct our lives. That guess what? I'm trusting the Lord. Things aren't seemingly going as well as I thought they should. And God doesn't seem to be calling me for advice, but he has a plan, and I trust him, and I'm relying upon it. Discontentment is dangerous because it is also contagious. If you walk around your life being totally discontent, mad about the circumstances you're facing, then I guarantee the other loved ones in your life, and maybe the friends around your life, they will catch on to your discontentment. And they also will grow discontent. It's amazing how once you start throwing a pity party, many people would love to join your pity party. And you can turn any conversation into a sad conversation. If you're walking around discontent and complaining, then I guarantee there will be people that join you in your discontentment because discontentment is contagious. Discontentment is also destructive. Discontentment can get you to a place where you get so stuck on on focusing on what you don't have that you're missing the things that you do have right in front of you. Destructive in the sense that you're now complaining about this thing or that thing when there are other people or responsibilities right around you that need your tending to, that God has entrusted to you. And if you are discontent, then you are probably being destructive or at least not helpful to the very things God has entrusted to you. Discontentment is dangerous. Now, no doubt, Naomi's experiencing this discontentment. It's overwhelming to her. But when Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, are distraught, they're, they're overwhelmed by their grief. They're plagued by discontentment. It's just at that moment that God shows up and he brings a redeemer. A redeemer comes to the scene. A redeemer is someone who delivers someone or something by paying a price. That's what a redeemer is. So this person named Boaz now enters the scene and redeems. He's going to have to pay a price, but he's going to pay a price. He's going to redeem the entire situation. Look at verse 3 of chapter 2. It says that she happened, it's talking about Ruth now, it says she happened to come to the fields that were being gleaned by Boaz and his people. I don't think there's any happening here that's outside of God's control. God absolutely had control about her showing up at barley season, and then showing up at Boaz's fields. Boaz shows up. He sees this woman. He asked, who that? Right? In verse 5, he starts saying, who's that woman? Right? Verse 4 and 5, he he sees her, and then he asks, who's she? Uh, She's not one of mine. She's not one of my servants. I want to know who she is. We see two things that happen in chapter 2. 
In verse 13, it's very clear, if not before, that he noticed her. He noticed this woman is here, and she wasn't a part of my my purview, my responsibility up until this moment. He noticed her. And oh, isn't the Lord that we serve the same way? He notices us. In our discontentment, he notices us. Not just because we complain and are the squeaky wheel who needs attention, but he notices us. He notices us, and then he provides for us. You see that in verse 14 and beyond. He gives us what we need. He actually provides for her what would have been equivalent to maybe five gallons of barley. He gives her enough food for two weeks' time. He provides for her. And so, my friends, God also does the same thing for us. She could have easily been caught into Naomi's pity party. She could have gone on thinking, I have no hope. She goes out scrounging for food. She shows up at this place where she finds a man who is there and is willing to be generous to her. And and she, she sees at least someone, a redeemer, if not God himself, is providing for her. The story goes on where she's kind of taken by this guy. Some people call this the greatest Christmas love story because it happened in Bethlehem, the same place that Christmas took place. It is an amazing love story. She's kind of taken by him. He seemingly is taken by her. And she shows up at what is called the threshing floor one night. We see this in chapter 3, verse 6 specifically. She shows up at the threshing floor. What's a threshing floor? A threshing floor is a a large circular area where they would have had the grain and, and all of the stems of the grain, everything there, the shells of the grain, it all would have been put on the threshing floor. It would have been the highest part of Bethlehem. And there at the threshing floor is the boss, Boss Boaz. He's there overseeing what's happening. And what would happen is an oxen or some animal would go around the threshing floor, literally stomping on the grain, but also pulling behind it this board that had these little stones in it, something rough to kind of rake through or shake up the barley, to crack it open, and the barley would fall to the ground. And then there would be some with these large pitchforks called winnowing forks, and they would take it and they would shove it into the barley, the piles of the grain there, along with the oxen's urine and poop and all of that kind of stuff, and they would throw it up into the air, and the wind would throw away what didn't need to remain. And the seeds would fall to the ground. It would have been the the most profitable part of obviously the whole process. It would have made sense that Boaz was there. The threshing floor. The threshing floor throughout scripture represents judgment, but it also represents goodness. Did you know that the temple, the meeting place of God in Jerusalem, was founded upon a threshing floor? That the top of Mount Moriah, where the temple was, was a threshing floor for ancient Jerusalem or the city of David. That same place is where a temple was placed. So now go six miles down to the south. There's another mountain with a threshing floor. And there at the top of this mountain, the significance of all that the Bible seems to breathe into the threshing floor happens there. It's a place of goodness, of provision but also a place of judgment. Boaz could have said, off with your head, woman. Why are you here right now? He could have sent her away, but he didn't. If anything, he welcomed her closer. He welcomed her to come in and and be with him. The story goes on. We'll pick back up with chapter 4 in a moment. But but I want, before we leave chapter 3, for you to see the way that God took discontentment And changed it to be contentment or trust in the life of Ruth. She got to a place where she trusted that the provisions of God would come through this redeemer named Boaz. She even says in verse 9 of chapter 3, spread your wings over me. (laughs) What a picture, right? I only wish Molly would say, spread your wings over me. This idea of like, Let me know that I'm safe in your arms. Let me know that you got me. She trusted the provision of God through the Redeemer Boaz. She was content with how Yahweh 
the name for the Lord in the Old Testament, she was content with how Yahweh was working through her circumstances, though she had already had amazing amounts of loss and pain. Are you content with how the Lord is working in your life, though you may have had amazing amounts of loss and pain? Let's define contentment. Contentment is being free of care because we are satisfied with what we already possess. That's what contentment is. It is free of care because I'm satisfied already with what I possess. As you look at the word contentment or the, the root of it in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, it's this idea of being pleased. It is being fully pleased, being happy. That's not a bad way to think of contentment, but the Greek in the New Testament takes it a little bit further. It's, it's not just being pleased, it's satisfied to the core of who I am. It's an inward satisfaction to the very bottom of my soul. And we as Christians are instructed to be content. First Timothy chapter 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. You see what Paul's saying here to his young mentor, Timothy? Godliness and contentment, both important. We don't take anything out of this world. So why do we strive so hard to grab more of this world? He says, as long as we got food and we got clothes, we have every reason to be content. I think it's a command to be content, but I think it is also a promise that God will give us everything we need. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Here's the promise. For God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The command is don't go grabbing at your life to, to have more. Leave yourself free from the love of things in this world because what you have already is God himself. We are content because we have God and God is all we need. So let me begin to apply this idea to your life by giving you three actions that I think we can learn from Ruth about maintaining contentment and hopefully cultivating it to a higher level in our life. First action is this. Look ahead to the future. Naomi got a little bit uh, farsighted. She, she wasn't seeing things clearly. She couldn't really see what was in front of her. She couldn't see what was far out there. She could only see her pain of the present or the pain of the past. But I think the command for us is to remember that we have a future ahead of us that is going to be fully redeemed by Christ. And though we may have moments of sadness or discontentment in this life, we have a Savior who will bring everything, everything, everything full circle when he sends his Son back to bring us into eternity with himself, but to rule over all of the world. In James chapter 5, verse 8, we're told, be patient. Establish your hearts. I like that. Firm up your hearts. Establish your hearts. Why? For the coming of the Lord is at hand. We look ahead to the future. Yes, this world will disappoint you. And you won't have everything you want or need. But you have a Savior who is coming, and the coming of the Lord is at hand. Oh yeah, Pastor Josh, but people have been saying that for 2,000 years that Jesus is coming, and he's not coming anytime soon. And have you seen the world, and you watch the news, and it's bad out there. Yeah, I do. I watch it all. I see it all. And 2,000 years ago, they did think Jesus was coming. And guess what? He hasn't come yet because he knows the exact time when he should come. His timing is perfect. He's not delayed. He's not caught in traffic. He'll be here exactly when he's supposed to be here. And we live every day as if today is the day he will come. We're content, we're patient, and we wait for the Lord. My friends, I want you to believe that when God's redemptive work reaches its culmination, there will be unending joy for all of us. 
But if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then God's redemptive work has begun in your life. And you have every reason to have joy, even if you have a little bit of a want problem. You continue to find yourself dissatisfied. You have Jesus. You have Jesus. So be content with him and know he's coming again for us. Boaz did what he needed to do to redeem Ruth and God blessed it. You can see what's happening in chapter 4 is he goes through the right path. I'll summarize the beginning of this chapter for you. He goes through the right path to find the perfect redeemer. Uh, There was kind of an order of redeemers of those who were supposed to take over the household of Elimelech, the man who died, Naomi's husband. And so he goes through the right order saying, listen, I got to find the right redeemer. He actually even finds the right person who should redeem Ruth, who should marry Ruth. And he says, can you take her? Are you ready to take her? And he basically was like, nope, I can't do it. I can't do it. So what did Boaz do? He stepped in and the Lord blessed it. The Lord blessed it big time. Look at verse 14 through 16 of chapter 4. After they had been given a son in verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, they had a son, then the blessing was acknowledged. No longer was it bitterness, it's now blessing. It says, then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who you love, who loves you, excuse me, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. What this passage is saying is that God provided for Naomi, but no doubt certainly provided for Ruth. While she may have been stuck on the past, it's as if even the women around her are saying, lift your eyes to the future. You will now be cared for. Your legacy has been restored. Which leads me to a second point of application. Even though things were hard for Naomi and Ruth to this point, they have to thank God for what had happened in the past. If we're going to maintain contentment, we must spend moments thanking God for what he has done in the past. He was so faithful to them. He brought them back to this land where they would meet Boaz, where they would find a redeemer, where the legacy and the lineage would go on. He was so faithful to not say, well, they're done, or even I'm done with them because they left, they didn't trust me in a famine, they married Moabite wives, I'm over them. God could have, way back in chapter 1, said, I'm over them. But instead he remained faithful. And they could look back over their past and go, wow, look at God's faithfulness, look at God's faithfulness, look at God's faithfulness. And finally, at the end of the book, it seems that there's some praising happening because because they realize just how faithful God had been. Here's an application for you. We must bless the Lord by praising him for the working out of his purposes in the midst of our pain. He's doing what he sees best. And he's doing it even while we hurt. He's so faithful to work out his purposes. You might be sitting here today saying, I hate my past. I hate it. I wish so badly I could erase the mistakes I made. I live with the shadow of my own sin over me all the time. As Psalm 51 says, my sin is ever before me. Maybe you're in that place where you're saying, my mistakes of the past, I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. But listen to me. Listen. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then he redeems even your worst decisions. And he uses all of those things still to form the perfect plan for your life so that his son will gain glory. Maybe it's time for you to stop living with shame of your past or beating yourself up over what you can't go back and change anyway and start praising the Lord for his faithfulness. The third thing I think we can learn from Ruth about cultivating a heart of gratitude is maintaining a perspective in the present. Yes, we trust him with the future. We stop complaining about the past and trust that he redeems our past. But then we keep a right perspective in the present. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in whatever kind of good circumstances you face as long as they're pleasing to you. And you no, no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says, 
Give thanks in all circumstances. Not just the ones that please you. But in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It doesn't get more firm than that. This is God's will for you. That you would praise him no matter the circumstances you face. Some of us get stuck looking back at the past going, well, I wish I could go back there. The story is told about a, a pilot who's flying over the Appalachian Mountains. And he continued to fly over this one spot. And every time he flew over the spot, he'd kind of tilt the plane and he'd look down at this river. Finally, his co-pilot said to him once, why is it that every time we pass this spot, you look down at that river? And he said, because when I was a boy, I used, to sh I used to go fishing down at that spot in the river. And I would look up at the plains and wish that I could fly. And he said, now I'm flying. And I look down at that river and I wish that I was fishing. <laughs> Michael agrees with that. <laughs> I think at times we can grow discontent over the circumstances we're at, wishing we could go back, wishing we could go back. And we need to stop and realize where we're at is exactly where God has us. Some of us are discontent because we see what other people have and we're not rejoicing in the Lord and in the present because we're jealous of everybody else and what they have in the present. I've heard that if you long for the grass to be greener, like what you see on the other side of fence, then you have to also be willing to take on their water bill. <laughs> you don't know their struggles. You don't know what other people are facing. You don't know what's going on in their life. And maybe you need to stop comparing because that's fostering in your heart a major sense of discontentment. And that's sinful if you're not trusting and praising and giving thanks in all circumstances to the one true, true God who has given you those circumstances. My friends, this story progresses in such a way that we learn at the end of this story that the lineage of the greatest king of Israel came because of this Christmas love story that happened in Bethlehem. This is King David's grandma. This is King David's grandpa, Boaz. This is the lineage that gave way to King David. This didn't happen by chance. God used all of this, including the complaining and discontentment, to, to lead to the greatest king that ever lived in Israel's history. But not just that. Get this. This gave way to then the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, in the whole lineage passage, in verse 5 and 6, it mentions Boaz. It says, And Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And then it goes on to then five or six more verses say, and all of this was a part of the lineage of Christ. Do you see about how a Moabite woman, who probably struggled with discontentment, was used to further the lineage of David so far as to reach the Son of, Christ, Son of God, which is Christ, so that we could be forever redeemed. God has a plan. So I leave you with these thoughts of application. My friends, we can be content because God's resources are limitless. He has no end to the resources that he needs to work our circumstances in such a way that pleases him and brings glory to his son. My friends, we can be content because God's presence is consistent. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So be content. And we can be content because God's plan is perfect. If he can use Boaz and Ruth in the story of bringing the lineage of Christ together so that we would have a redeemer, he can use whatever in your life, whatever circumstances seem odd or painful, he can use whatever in your life to, br to bring his son greater glory. Trust it. Lean in on it and worship a good God who's working all things together.
for the good of those who love him to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a, a perfect God, a God who has a plan, a God who's constantly working through our failures, a God who's constantly striving to get the glory for our successes, though at times, Lord, we probably give ourselves more glory for our successes than we should. Lord, we know that you're due all the glory for every part of our life. And so for the moments where we complain under our breath or think we know better or think you should consult us, we say we're sorry and please forgive us. And God, for the areas where we need to trust you more, please help us trust you. Help us see the goodness of your son in every circumstance. We love you, Father. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.